Hi, my name is Ryan Baxter. No. Thank, thank you, Mr. Newman. Uh, today I will be, is, do we have the video? Yes, we do. All right. Today I will be discussing the effects of video games during, during early childhood development as it relates to juvenile delinquency. And the thing that I'm looking at is uh, no, please. I told Back, you. Please. Um, we're looking at are video games good or bad? And does it even matter? Next slide. Okay, Alright, so I'd like to have a show of hands. Who recognizes any of the games here? That's, that's right. Um, <laughs> thank you, Tony. Um, and who knows a young person? who plays games regularly. Anyone here know a young person? So every hand is going up. What's the show? This shows our society. It shows that we live in a capitalistic society, a consumeristic society, where games are marketed to the youngest of children. Games are almost impossible to avoid. Everyone is exposed to them, and everyone is urged to play them. Uh, next slide. So some important things to note are that games are all different. They have different objectives. They have different means of which you can get to that objective. They all require a different skill set, a different mindset to get through the game. And then we have to think, what kind of games actually exist? There are action shooter games where the, the solution is pretty much you have a gun, use it, death, death, murder. And then there are strategy games that require a bit more thought. They make you look at the game, think about what is going on, and what you can do to solve whatever problem is arising. These require more thought. Um, and then we have to look at how external stimulus affects people, especially as they're getting older. Because from the Bobo doll experiment that was done by exposing children to a violent situation and then giving them a similar situation to act on, we saw that young people usually will act out externally the same way that they had seen. They will become violent if they witness the violent situation, at least in the short term. And prolonged exposure to the same violence could lead to a violent personality. So we need to look at the difference between people who started gaming at different ages, as well as if they were exposed to violence or something a little more strategic. And then finally, what is juvenile delinquency? because it's, it's a big word, it's very complex. Merriam-Webster defines it as a conduct by a juvenile characterized by antisocial behavior that is beyond parental control and therefore subject to legal action. Now that's a lot of words to say kids do bad things, things that adults don't want them to do. This could be falling behind in school, dropping out of school, violence, it could be tagging up a, a street post with a spray paint can, pretty much things that are bad. Next slide, please. So in the war on games, there's pretty much two groups. There's the group that's for it and the group that's against it. Hello, welcome. Uh, next slide. So first we have the gamer group. And these are the people that have high opinions of the gaming world. They preach about how games teach us to focus our minds on an objective and to work towards that, taking different situations into account. Uh, it, they also preach that it gives us a release from the real world, relieving our stress because we can escape from the complexities that emerge in the real world that may not have a solution. Whereas in games, there's almost always a way to win. If not, it's usually a bad game. <laughs> uh, they, games allow us to go on adventures that we would never be able to imagine in the real world. The, uh, Mi Miyamoto, the creator of games like Legend of Zelda, he said, I love video games because I've saved about 47 princesses in my lifetime. That's not something that you get to do in the real world. At least, I don't. And if you know someone who can do that, please get me in touch with them. Uh, it teaches us to overcome challenges and it gives us that great, amazing feeling of I've worked really hard on this and I finally made it through that level. Even if there's a more difficult level right afterwards. And they know that eventually there's an end and when you get to that end it's so fulfilling. And then finally, they talk about how games teach us new skills and knowledge that we wouldn't be able to get to in our, our normal lives. We, we can learn diplomacy, we can learn um, checking of documents in some games, which is more fun than it sounds. 
Uh, you, you can learn all these survival skills and knowledge about things that you would have no clue about if you just went through your normal life. Next slide, please. Opposite group, concerned parents. People that see their kids falling into gaming obsession. They worry about the fact that a lot of games expose their kids to violence. And the violence encourages their kids to act violent, at least from what they see. Uh, Antisocial behavior is another big worry. They think that if kids spend all their time playing games, they're not going to get outside, they're not going to be able to talk to people, they're not going to make as many friends, which that also plays into our definition of juvenile delinquency. Please remember that it is characterized by antisocial behavior. And then lack of motion, because you really only work out your all-important thumb muscles when playing a game. And while those may be important, there's a lot of other muscles in your body that go unnoticed, and there's a lot of endorphin release that's missed there if you're just sitting on a computer screen flexing your fingers. And then sunshine and vitamin D are vital to your emotions and the functioning of your body. And you don't get that sitting inside a dark room with a computer. Next slide, please. All right, so what are the facts? Gaming is not necessarily good or bad because it's diverse. There's different types of games. And depending on what types of games we have, it could be positive or negative. And so we need to examine what makes a game not only is it a game. And then we also have to look at the people, the individual people when they started gaming. Uh, things like how long they play every day, and also if they identify themselves as a gamer, because someone who identifies himself as a gamer may be more likely to those changes that gaming brings. Uh, so the survey that I distributed for my thesis asked about all of these things. They asked daily playtime, age at which gaming starts, the identification, whether they're a gamer or no. Uh, what type of game they like to play, which was listed as action shooters, strategy slash sandbox, which is games like Minecraft where you build something out of nothing, and then those who did not partake in any gaming at all. And then finally, I asked them to rate themselves on their performance in school from 0 to 100, and I asked them to please relate that to the grades that they, were com they commonly received. So that would give us a good idea of where they stood in school. Bailey, if you could go to the next slide. And that is not as pretty of a color as I chose. <laughs> okay, so this is examining the genre. Now you might notice there's a really big decrease here. And this is, this is something huge that I was, was going through and I found. Action games are a decrease by about 20 points in the average score that people receive that commonly play that. Um, which means that people who tend to play action games tend to receive lower grades in school, and that is, that is very significant. That's about two letter grades difference, which could devastate your GPA if you just get obsessed with Call of Duty or Battlefield 4, games that promote uh, survival with a gun, or problem solving with just a gun, or other violent means. But strategy games, and I was hoping that we would see a large increase in the score of strategy gamers. Unfortunately, this is not the case. However, if you look over at the standard deviation graph, you'll notice that the standard deviation for strategy gamers is much lower, meaning that if you are a strategy gamer, your score will be much closer to this 90 degree average that's shared by people who don't game and people who play strategy games. This shows that it's less of a gamble if you're a strategy gamer than if you don't game at all. You're more likely to get into that small bracket around 90. Next slide, please.